Uh, many of you know Dr. Mark Haskins. He's been active in the field of lysosomal research for more than 40 years. From his beginning as an NIH medical genetics trainee in 1975, working on MPS6, Martolomei syndrome, through his appointment as Professor Emeritus in 2014. His career in lysosomal disease research has been focused on MPS diseases. His research has been conducted at the University of Pennsylvania, which he has helped to make a preeminent center of large animal model work in the area of lysosomal diseases. He is known as one of the most collaborative, innovative, and successful researchers in the field. His research in large animal models ran parallel to the course of important developments in the basic cell and molecular biology of lysosomal diseases between 1970 and 1990. When the foundations in biochemistry and molecular genetics in lysosomal diseases made prospects for a therapy possible beginning in the 1990s, Dr. Haskins' leadership in the preventative, uh, sorry, in the preservation, development, and elucidation of dozens of large animal models meant the models were ready to be used to help advance treatment development for patients. He has collaborated in a meaningful way with numerous groundbreaking researchers in the field, both nationally and internationally. Over the several decades, he has participated and helped lead critical work on pathogenesis and therapies, including bone marrow transplant, enzyme replacement, and novel medical therapies, including gene therapy. He has uh, been active as a mentor at all levels with students from undergraduates, graduates, residents, postdocs, junior faculty, and some of us old geezers. Uh, Mark has also served in important capacities in multiple advocacy and research funding organizations, including the National MPS Society and the National Tay Sachs Foundation and the Allied Diseases Foundation. So at this time, Mark, would you come up and officially receive the Roscoe O'Brady Award? Thanks so Thank much you. for all your work. <laughs> What's that? Do you want to shake hands or do you want to risk dropping it? <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mark. Okay, I'm going to switch over to the beard mic, which explains why I wear it. And you will see that I was uh, the award announcement had me wearing a top hat. I thought I would bring a top hat, most, mostly to uh, allow you to understand that these were worn by men who would then go to the opera, and in sitting in their seat, they would then collapse the hat so that it would fit underneath their seat. And then after the show was over, they can make it work. So that's my first illusion. <laughs> okay, I have no relevant financial relationships related to this talk. And this is Roscoe Brady, and here is the list of the past award recipients, many of whom are here in the audience, uh, and many of whom I have worked with and known for many years. Uh, so part of the question here is, why am I now on the list? And I think it's because I play well with others. Uh, I looked over the publications that I've had over the last 40 years, and I've come up with 145 co-authors uh, in that time, which indicates, of course, the era of single publication, single author publications is pretty well over anyway, but uh, I've collaborated with a large number of people. These are the primary co-authors that I've had, and the first uh, was Don Patterson, who hired me uh, and got me involved in genetic research looking for large animal models of human genetic disease. And that's because Don had discovered in the 60s that uh, Kisan dogs had a congenital heart defect called Tetralogy of Fallot, which is genetic and was not recognized to be genetic in children, but is now uh, because of the work that he did. And he then began a uh, long-term grant through the NIH to look for, find, characterize, and make available large animal models of human genetic disease. And Don's philosophy was finding the models was not sufficient. What was necessary was to use the, not the models. And that leads to the second uh, primary person, Bob Desnick, uh, previous award winner of this uh, award, who uh, collaborated with us and with his enthusiasm for large animals and his mentorship certainly was uh, instrumental in my ability to continue uh, to work.
the, uh, the third person is Kathy Ponder, who uh, 18 years ago uh, subverted my decision to try and retire early uh, by developing uh, retroviral vectors that we then used uh, to begin looking at gene therapy. Uh, another of the things that Bob Desnick did was introduce me to not only a superb scientist, but one of what I consider uh, the nicest human beings I know, which is Ed Schuchman. Okay, so I've taken the title of this uh, from uh, a letter from 1159 that talked about, I've seen a little further by standing on the shoulders of giants. And certainly that list of people um, that have it allowed me to see further, and I think everyone in this room uh, has those kinds of stories. Um, this is a slide that was kindly provided by uh, Steve Walkley, a former winner of this award, uh, from uh, the 1928 quote that the folks in this room are looking for uh, the riddles and lessons of the rarer maladies um, and it is astonishing to see how many people attend this meeting. Uh, when I began, I would think that if you could come up with two dozen people interested in research on lysosomal storage diseases, that was a feat. And now we're pushing 1,800. It's really uh, astonishing. And then <clears throat> there are so many people involved in this kind of research uh, describing the lysosome uh, back in 1949. And then the, we went through a descriptive phase of the various syndromes. These are the ones that primarily I started with, with the animal models. Uh, in 1957, cattle with alpha manosidosis, and we'll come back to that a little bit later in, in looks at therapy. At any rate, <clears throat> maybe jumping ahead a little, this was the uh, first animal model of a lysosomal storage disease uh, that we discovered at Penn and turned out to be the uh, focus of my PhD research uh, was Susie Reeves, uh, a Siamese cat with MPS6. <clears throat> I remember being so impressed by a pathology uh, professor that I had at Penn uh, who could remember the names of various animals that he had been involved in doing the pathologic diagnosis. He was a neuropathologist. Um, and now I find myself in a similar uh, circumstance, 1975. I remember uh, Susie, actually Susie is buried next to my house in Philadelphia. And I remember Mrs. Reeves who also had significant arthritis and she would arrange for Susie to climb up a little bridge to get to uh, her bed because of uh, the arthritic aspects of MPS6 in the cat. The next uh, picture will show, uh, oh, okay, the first MPS1 cat, uh, which was uh, Rosebud Bolinsky, and those we found outside of Philadelphia uh, because they were being screened, their urine screened uh, for lysosomal disease. And then uh, Mork was sent to us from the University of California at Davis uh, with the suspected uh, MPS disorder, and we eventually, we named it Mork because we thought it was going to be Morkio syndrome, but uh, actually uh, he had MPS 7. Uh, we also found a cat with alpha manosidosis near Philadelphia uh, that we did, from which we developed a colony. Uh, this had actually been described in England and in Switzerland previous to us finding uh, this cat, and again, another cat. These were uh, uh, primarily Persians. Uh, were found uh, outside of Boston. So the concept of the large animal models, especially in, in dogs and cats, has been that most breeds are genetic isolates and by interbreeding you bring forth the uh, recessive mutations particularly that uh, you can then characterize and evaluate. Um, also working with uh, David Wenger, uh, we developed a colony of uh, West Highland White Terriers and eventually Cairn Terriers with globoid cell leukodystrophy. This was perhaps one of the first animal models that was described and known to be a lysosomal storage disease in, in dogs uh, because the pathology is so pathognomonic. The large uh, globoid cells in the CSF uh, 
and the infiltration of lobovoid cells, which are actually macrophages into the white matter of the brain, uh, is identical to what you see in children, and so they were able to diagnose uh, these. Uh, we also received uh, a group of cats from Switzerland with mucolipidosis II. Uh, so one of the things that this center that Don had developed uh, was able to do was to attract people who found animal models of genetic disease that we would then take on and be able to uh, uh, produce and then make available for study. Okay, we moved into the uh, investigative phase with cross-correction with Liz Neufeld, who is here and has won this award, and the Mano 6 phosphate recognition. Bill Sly, who has also won the award and is here, uh, were uh, clearly uh, pioneers and you know, standing on the shoulders of giants fits them perfectly. Uh, this is Don Patterson, who had the vision in the early 1970s, in 1971, to develop a section of medical genetics uh, at Penn in order to find these animal models of human genetic disease. Uh, Don also uh, instilled in me a love of the language, uh, which I'll get back to in a bit. So the investigative phase was trying to understand pathogenesis. All of the grants that I ever wrote involved both therapy but also pathogenesis. Once you understand how the disease is working, the story of the disease, that then will lead you to be able to uh, develop appropriate therapies. And you know, this research is just moving ahead so quickly, as I said, Finding a, half a, a couple of dozen people involved in research in the 70s uh, was hard to do, and now uh, this meeting every year brings together so many people involved in the research. One of the philosophies that I've developed is that research requires optimism, uh, which is a characteristic shared by the families of uh, the children with these diseases, and an appreciation for delayed gratification. If you want to do science in this field, you have to be an optimist. You never write a grant you don't expect to get funded. You never write a paper you don't expect to get published. You don't do an experiment you don't expect to work. And therefore, you must be an optimist. But you have to be delayed gratification. After 40 years of doing this, we still don't have the answers to everything. And so I think that those are characteristics you need to look for in postdocs and people you want to bring along into the fields. So where are we going now? Uh, we have prenatal testing with family history, clinical diagnosis, newborn screening, which at least up until this point requires available therapy, enzyme testing, genome analysis, in vitro fertilization, Embryo diagnosis, CRISPR is now, of course, moving forward uh, and then into the areas of therapies. And there are multiple therapies. You'll notice that I put replacement in parentheses. This is one of uh, my pet peeves. Um, we aren't replacing anything, so I like enzyme therapy, not enzyme replacement therapy. Um, it's something that I've mentioned previously and I don't ex actually expect to change the world any more than changing people who use data as a singular noun as opposed to a plural noun. But I still point out that enzyme therapy, we're, not, we're, we're perhaps replacing misfunction or no function with normal function, but we're not replacing the enzyme itself. In some cases, there is no enzyme to replace. Um, and so I think that what Don taught me about Paying attention to language is one of those things that uh, I, I pass on. And so there are all these various approaches, which I'm sure are familiar to everyone here. Uh, so here is a book. Uh, Bob Desnick got it right. It's enzyme therapy, not enzyme replacement therapy. Um, and clearly, the principle of enzyme therapy, bone marrow transplant was then used. Bob wrote the book. Uh, and John Hopwood uh, worked with me. I provided him with cats to try and do uh, enzyme therapy uh, back in the early 80s. Uh, that was a time when molecular biology had not provided the opportunity to make the enzyme, and therefore it was a purification uh, 
uh, approach to purifying uh, the 4-sulfatase in order to use it uh, to test in cats, which fortunately, um, this is the approach to transplantation where the enzyme is secreted uh, and taken up uh, and forms the basis of most of the enzyme therapy, the transplant therapies, and gene therapies. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time on this slide, which really doesn't have much information in it, but I'll give you a 101 course in ruminant reproduction. Um, a free martin, as described at the bottom, uh, is the normal outcome of a mixed set, set of twins in cattle. And what happens in cattle is that the chorion is fused between two uh, fetuses, and there is a transfer of hormones as well as cells. And so the male hormones, particularly testosterone and, and, and Mullerian inhibiting factor, are transferred to the female, and therefore she is masculinized uh, and is infertile and doesn't have normal ovaries. Um, externally, she still looks female. Uh, but they also share cells, and so these cells uh, can cross, and you end up with the female being also a chimeric, so she is XX and XY in her peripheral blood cells. And so it's basically a, an in utero bone marrow transplant that's occurred. And um, this was used by uh, Bob Jolly in, in New Zealand uh, to look at what he described as this experiment of nature. Uh, he did use replacement therapy. He may have been the first. I should yell at him sometime. Um, but at any rate, uh, what happened was that in the 1950s, the use of artificial insemination in cattle became practical and useful. And it turns out that you can take a single ejaculate from a bull and dilute it and freeze it and inseminate more than, I think, 350 cows from one single ejaculate. And you can collect males daily for weeks at a time. And this frozen semen should undergo what's called a progeny test. So what you should do with this frozen semen is you should inseminate a series of females, raise up their female offspring, and breed them back to their father. And by doing that, see whether or not there is uh, a problem, a genetic problem in, in that male. And this was not done uh, effectively in Australia and New Zealand. And it turned out that at one point, I believe that 25% of the uh, Angus and Murray Gray cattle in Australia and New Zealand were carriers for alpha manicidosis which is a significant and severe disease uh, with a dropout of Purkinje cells in the cerebellum. And so it was devastating to the cattle industry. And what happened was that they eventually went through and by enzyme testing, eradicated alpha manicidosis from, uh, from the population of cattle in Australia and New Zealand. But in the midst of the 70s, the early 70s, Bob Jolly noticed a twin birth where the female was a free martin. Uh, didn't have to be, it could have been either, but she was affected with manicidosis and her male twin was not. I believe he was a carrier, but I'm not positive of that. At any rate, what he had then was this experiment of nature with this enzyme therapy of an in utero bone marrow transplant um, from a carrier male into this uh, affected female. And the concept was to look at what was the outcome. And this was published in Pediatric Research in 1976. Uh, it turned out that the female was not less affected. And so it was a failure of in utero bone marrow transplantation to affect uh, the alpha manicidosis in that calf. Um, early in the 1970s, there was a large number of children being treated with uh, particularly mucopolysaccharidosis 1, Hurler syndrome, with bone marrow transplant. And the first recipient of this award that I've received, um, Bill Crivet, was doing many of those uh, transplants. Uh, and then um, 
Uh, allogeneic bone marrow transplant was done by uh, Roseanne Taylor in Australia in dogs with fucosidosis, and Roseanne eventually became dean of the veterinary school uh, and shipped us dogs, so we have a colony of dogs with fucosidosis also at Penn. Um, and I'll switch to the bottom, the in utero transplantation of monocytic cells that Jan Apkowitz and I did in cats with alpha monocytosis, uh, trying to take monocytes, which are the precursors of the microglia in the brain, and do in utero transplants of cultured monocytes into feline embryos at about mid-gestation. Uh, and again, we saw no effect uh, no positive effect. It was a difficult experiment to manage because she was in Seattle and I was in Philadelphia. The cats did a lot of cross-country travel, but uh, it was not very successful. However, in the middle, uh, Steve Walkley, a former uh, awardee of this, uh, did bone marrow transplants with Mariana Thrall in Colorado uh, in cats with alpha manicidosis. And as I recall, uh, they did, he did these, the oldest cat was perhaps 8 to 12 weeks of age when given the bone marrow transplant and had a dramatic positive effect in these cats. Um, as I recall, one of them lived for many years and only showed minor clinical signs. If you held the cat upside down, it would have some nystagmus. I'm sure that Steve will correct me if I'm wrong. Oh. I, my memory was correct, great. Uh, at any rate, it showed that bone marrow transplant in some of these diseases could make a dramatic uh, difference. <clears throat> so when, when you go back over the field, it's helpful to look at various different diseases and approaches. Um, what we were using in the cats with menacidosis with just monocytes, uh, Roseanne Taylor had used uh, total lymphoid irradiation as opposed to total body irradiation. Um, so it, some of the results may depend upon the species, uh, may depend upon the disease, and may depend upon the approach to therapy. Now yeast is, as it turns out, not just for beer and bread. And if people had not been able to achieve uh, grant funding in the early 70s to study yeast, Molecular biology as we know it might not exist because most of the principles of molecular biology were discovered and elucidated in the uh, uh, study of yeast. And then others uh, looking at recombinant enzyme uh, therapy um, after you have PCR, which was someone who thought about what are the bacteria that live in hot springs, what do their enzyme systems look like? Uh, and basically looking at that kind of system and then making a practical use of it uh, to be able to develop PCR allowed then for uh, the development of uh, molecular generation of these enzymes and Liz Neufeld and Emil Kakis, both winners of this award, uh, were able then to produce the iduronidase uh, to treat MPS1 dogs, cats, and children, uh, and led the way, and this is the uh, paper in 1996. So obviously, you look around and the number of diseases that now have enzyme therapy, um, but all dependent upon the ability to create the enzyme or to transplant uh, cells that can make the enzyme. Chaperone therapy, uh, many of these are moving ahead. This is a 2015 uh, review article. Um, one can find all of these uh, approaches. And then into gene therapy, uh, we started our work in the MPS7 dog using a retroviral vector which integrates and then retroviral vectors went through the uh, major concerns of uh, integration into dangerous positions. Uh, which fortunately has not proven uh, to be a problem, but uh, basically have been left behind with the advent now of AAV and other vectors. So this is the retroviral vector that Kathy Ponder made. Uh, 
and what we used was the canine beta-glucuronidase uh, cDNA, and it, it's still it's astonishing to me that you can take a virus, take pieces of it apart, plug back in other pieces, and get something that works. Um, and what we were trying to do, uh, and, and you know, Kathy is really the person who had the insight, patience, and knowledge to look at when would you apply this. So what we were looking for was you needed dividing cells for the retroviral vector to integrate and be incorporated into the DNA, and we were looking to try and target the liver. And in order to do that, we had to decide, we had to figure out when was the liver dividing enough that we could provide the vector and get integration into the liver. And so by doing BRDU studies uh, that Kathy directed uh, in normal dogs, we were able to discern that probably giving this injection uh, at about three days of age was appropriate. And then by five days of age, we had enough transduction of hepatocytes to produce uh, effective uh, degrees of, uh, of expression. So it, it was, you know, it was, it was really her ability to understand what we needed to do and direct the experiments. Uh, again, I had the animals and the experience and the knowledge uh, and the technical staff to be able to do the kinds of experiments which she had uh, determined. And so we ended up doing this uh, and uh, the first, uh, group of dogs. Uh, we were naming these animals after TV shows or TV characters, so um, you'll see we discussed uh, Preston, who was Sergeant Preston of the Yukon. We had the Cisco Kid, we had Dale Evans and Roy Rogers, uh, and this was Penny, who was one of uh, uh, the characters in, the, uh, in one of the TV shows. And one of the things that I like to point out to this is that when you do gene therapy for genetic diseases, you're making GMO animals. And in discussing this particularly with patient uh, advocacy, advocacy groups, uh, the idea that uh, GMOs have this horrible reputation when you're thinking about them in plants or animals for food, uh, but the reality is that anyone who undergoes gene therapy then becomes a genetically modified organism and that it, it puts a little bit of a different slant on it. At any rate, uh, we were fortunate enough uh, to get this picture with Penny, who was able to stand, uh, and the affected dog that is laying down who cannot stand. I, I have a series of videos which I haven't brought because transferring them is difficult, and many people have already seen them anyway. But at any rate, we did the PNAS uh, article um, to show that you could, in fact, inject at three days of age um, a single dose of uh, the retroviral vector and produce sufficient enzyme expression to alter the clinical outcome of the disease. Um, we also did this in MPS6 cats. Uh, the person who designed this was at molecular uh, therapy and I think was, thought himself perhaps a, uh, somebody that was, an Andy Warhol uh, <laughs> artist. Uh, we just gave him four pictures, and the middle uh, shows you uh, a normal cat, an affected cat, and two siblings, litter mates that had been treated. And you can see, particularly the size of the ear, uh, as well as the facial malformation that occurs in the MPS6 uh, cats. Uh, and these animals, too, uh, had dramatically improved uh, skeletal. Uh, systems. But there is a lesson here. Uh, in the MPS7 gene therapy dogs, Preston had 60-fold normal GUSBI activity for 11 years, and this was appropriately mannose-6-phosphorylated enzyme. And so for every minute of every day for 11 years, he had 60 times normal, and Dale uh, had 43% of normal serum activity for nine years. And so we had a various, so you had from heterozygote levels to 60 times normal. Uh, and from five days of age through 11 years, and while Preston could stand and run, he could not run normally. And 
his cervical spine lesions improved but were not prevented. So even by five days of age, that kind of level of enzyme activity. And so the lesson here is that even high dose constant serum enzyme very early alone may not be enough in some diseases. And so you know, I, I just like to point out that there are limitations. And a word that I've never used in any of these uh, is cure. And I think it's important that people recognize that you can dramatically improve the quality of life of uh, people with these diseases. But curing the diseases at this stage, unless you get in probably po just post-fertilization uh, with perhaps CRISPR or one of the other technologies, uh, if it's dependent only upon providing enzyme, uh, cure is, is a difficult uh, uh, decision. So I was told that there is a trap door here, which if I don't finish on time will uh, take me down below. But I'm going to finish early and give Patty Dixon, someone with whom I have collaborated as well, uh, uh, an opportunity to present some information on PS1 dogs. But before I do that, I always end these slides by pointing out whether you have patients that are large or patients that are small, what you want to do is provide therapy that is as precise as possible. And therefore, if you have a blind kangaroo, you need a guide frog, not a guide dog. And we all at the uh, MPS Society at the University of Pennsylvania would like to thank you for your attention.